and she'll open up even more. So in a sense, I'm doing something. But I'm doing it without losing any of that openness that allows me to feel. And I think a great deal of the skill of hands-on work lies in a two-part process. Learning how to really open yourself up, internal expansion, lengthening and widening, in such a way that that expansion goes right through your arms and legs, feet and hands, so you can really get that whole body, whole nervous system, open connection to the other person. That allows a two-way exchange. I can feel more of what's happening in Sandra, and my direction can have a positive, helpful influence on her, I hope. But there's a part two, which is often that's not enough. People need, there we are, Sandra, that's right, right on up to that's it. I'm giving her a little uplift through the spine there and through that shoulder and she can respond to it. When I do that little extra with my hands, I'm doing it without losing or compromising the whole internal expansion in myself. What I'm not doing, if I mimic, you know, there's her, sh I was there and I was there, I'm not doing anything like that. Mm -hmm. I, you okay? Yeah. <laughs> if you can learn not to squeeze yourself, you can do anything with your hands, provided you don't squeeze yourself. So that's point two. You can do anything with your hands, yes, provided you don't Yes, that's part yourself. two. And, yeah. and I like these days to call that doing on a non-doing foundation. And I think that's a very important skill. So I'll just exaggerate a little. Because Sandra responds beautifully. You see, there's a little bit of a pull down the sides of your neck there. But you're dealing with it very well. You're directing. You're gradually improving the situation. I'll just give you a little further help, a little hint with my hands, fingers, thumb tips. There we are, like that. I moved you up a little bit, would you say? You went with it pretty well, though, didn't you? <laughs> John? Hello? Would you say that where you put your hands also comes out of your own kind of control? I um, don't know what that he means. Tell that me what word. that means. Well, people often say, why do you put your hands there? Do you have your hands? Why do I put my hands there? Yeah, like why did you choose to do that then? Because I felt she could do with some help there. Okay, so that's... Because that's a place where she's interfering with yeah. her primary control. So that information you got because you were free enough in yourself, expanded enough in yourself to receive it from yeah. her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You start to receive that kind... You start to... I mean, it sounds weird at first, but it's not weird at all. I tell you one way I explain it. I'm going to mess around with your clothes. <laughs> In a perfectly lawful way. Okay? It's, it's like if, if I was holding the top of the dress there and something had gotten caught up in the fabric down here, I would feel, if I make a little movement, oh, something's in the way down there. It, it's that basic. It's yeah. not esoteric. The word intuition gets kicked around, but it's really, it's a refined, tactile sensitivity mm -hmm. that's partly also because I, I'm very familiar with the sense of integrated openness in myself. That also makes it easier for me to feel restrictions to it in another person. That is really nice, Sandra. Very, very nice. And can I just ask a real question? I'm just wondering, with having integrated openness in yourself, what if you don't have integrated openness in yourself? How would that feed into your hands? Are you going to misread 
Uh, let me answer that in a second. She's coming beautifully. There you let yourself come back a little and send your head up. Nice, nice. And so what I'm interested in, again, that wasn't perfect, but it was good. It was good. You know, so we're not, we're not perfectionists. It was good. And, you know, in fact, we won't even try to do it again because we're not perfectionists. We'll settle for that being good. Okay? Thank you. Leave it there. Uh, let me come to your question in a moment, just to hold on to a thread there. When I move somebody in or out of a chair, now back, uh, I remember having a whole conversation with Walter about this, about trajectory of movement. And I said, uh, where did go? I said, I'd had a conversation with Peggy Williams about taking people much more vertically out of the chair. And she said, oh, Walter used to do that. And I said, oh, did he? But he doesn't seem to do it now. Why? Why? And she said, yeah, I, I don't know. Why. So next time I saw Walter, I said, Peggy says you used to do this. <laughs> and you don't. And, and he said, in a wonderfully firm, emphatic voice, he said, well, John, I'll tell you what I think about that now. <laughs> and a heavy implication was, I'm not going to tell you what I thought about it then. <laughs> We're not going to go there. So I didn't go there. It was pretty clear. Uh, Walter was very kind, very compassionate, but very solid. And you knew when you couldn't push him. <laughs> anyway, he talked about the importance of the person staying in balance and not interfering with head, neck, back, etc. in the movement. So with both Alicia and Sandra, uh, as I bring them out of the chair, I'm interested in getting something like that effect that we talked about as unfolding, where that primary demand of the head to be supported and supported in such a way that the trunk is open enough for breathing, that primary demand isn't compromised or interfered with by the action of the legs trying to bring the body into being fully upright. So that you've got the voluntary activity of coming from sitting to being fully upright is in harmony with the underlying Dart said reflexes, these days they say responses, the underlying automatic postural or anti-gravity responses. So if I feel that as I move you, ah, from her feet contact on the ground, she's, she's unfolding in an integrated way, I'm pretty happy with it. That's, you know, as I said, you know, yeah, we could improve that, but there's plenty of time gradually improve it, improve it, and you'll improve it, etc. The question. Uh, Robin? Yes. Tell me again what was that question? Oh, no, I was just wondering through Anne's question, um, whether whether she was thinking of the idea that if, if you're not um, opening and expanding, so if you say you've got a really tight shoulder. You being the teacher. You being the teacher. Yeah. How does that, I mean, obviously that interferes in a way. Is there some way you can get useful information from um, Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering whether that was behind Anne's question. Well, okay, let's, first of all, again, we're not perfectionists. If, if no. having good use or bad use was like turning the light switch on or off, uh, I don't think any of us should be in the room here. <laughs> so luckily for us, it, it's another continuum or spectrum. And you just have to be a little bit better. <laughs> in fact, it's quite mysterious. Um, somewhere in FM's writing, maybe it's in CCC, uh, he talks about conditions of use and manner of use. And it's a nice little useful distinction. And what he seems to be getting at is that supposing, going blank on examples, um, 
orchestral conductor. Conduct, I've been giving lessons to uh, one of the secondary conductors at the Met Opera in New York. Um, you know, obviously a basic habit in someone's manner of use might be this kind of thing. So, in a sense, that's relatively easy to deal with because point it out a few times and give them the experience that, oh, when I bring my hand up with the baton, etc., I actually don't need to scrunch up here. Okay, I, we can improve his manner of use. But there are also deeper, more chronic, what, you, what seem like almost structural conditions in people. Um, you know, the degrees of curvature in the spine, the degrees of compression in the spine, the underlying degree of flexibility in the connective tissue, which is different in different people. Um, the sort of things that, you know, this conductor might easily get away from that, but he's chronically a little bit, a little bit of kyphosis in the upper back uh, that affects the whole set of his thorax, affects the set of all of that on the lower body and so on. We might find that one or both of his parents had that, and a grandparent or two, and a sibling or two. And we might say, oh, well, that's probably just genetic, and therefore it won't change. But all of that is a bit of an open question. Uh, when you get to these deeper structural issues, it's surprising how they can change. Not, you know, they don't, the person with considerable kyphosis that runs in the family never becomes that paragon of uprightness of the Alexander pictures and the Alexander books. Um, but things can improve. And that, I think, was what he was getting at, talking about conditions of use. Some people have more difficult conditions of use. Their whole physical structure is more awkward, more dense, and so on, than others. But that doesn't mean that you can't address that uh, and gradually work with it. So all of us here in the room have different conditions of use. And it's amazing how I've, I've witnessed somebody who's gone through the training with me and has very difficult conditions of use. And in front of them is a young new student or somebody who's had half a dozen lessons who on some meaningless objective scale you would say, well, the student has better use than the teacher. Uh, if you had to sort of apply some rather oversimplified a scale of good use. But if the teacher is really making the best possible use she can of her particular conditions, she's going better than the student in front of her. It's an odd thing and a bit mysterious, but as long as you're doing your best to make good use of what you've got, doesn't matter how difficult what you've got is compared to the person in front of you, you'll be able, your hands will convey this integrated expansion. I don't really understand how it works, but it just does. <laughs> I mean, those of us who've had the pleasure of exchanging work with some remarkable past examples, Judy Leibovitz in New York, who was one of the co-founders of what's known as ACAT, American Center for the Alexander Judy was so deeply crippled from childhood polio, she walked with two sticks and looked like that. And she would come along, and there would be an array of stools for her to sit on around the teaching room. And she could sit beside you as you were sitting there, put down those sticks, put her hands on you, and give you a remarkable experience. My, my first <coughs> tell a story. <laughs> my first experience of Judy, I first met her at the 1986 International Congress of, uh, on Long Island in New York State. And we 
we got on well talking for the first couple of days, chatting to each other. On the third day, uh, there was some kind of lecture presentation, and I, it ends, and I'm a bit slow in getting my stuff together to get up and leave, and I'm sitting there looking at some papers, and a pair of hands comes around me here from behind. So I have no idea who this is sitting behind me. First thought that comes into my head was, pretty damn good. Good hands. Of course, I turn around and it's Judy. And I said, Judy, how are you getting that quality you've got in your hands on me? And she said, by widening, of course, while I put my hands on you. And I said, who taught you that? Nobody taught me that. I, I figured it out when I started trying to train teachers myself. And I thought, what a great credit to it, you know, to actually figure that out for yourself. Because it's, it's not an easy thing to figure out. <laughs> but, you know, Dillis Carrington, who from a uh, teenage neck surgery that went wrong, was permanently stuck with this kind of neck, upper back, you know, permanently neck forward, kyphosed upper back. Fantastic hands. And putting hands on her. I think it was something to do with oh, another one was Dick Walker who fell head first. Well, Patrick had from birth uh, congenital spastic torticollis. Yeah. And Dick Walker fell, landed on his head, falling down a flight of stairs. A crushed and twisted neck vertebra. It was amazing to work with these people and, and realize there's something about an integrated spread of elastic tone through the musculature, regardless of the distortions of the skeletal structure. Mm -hmm. It was an object lesson that it sure ain't about straightness. It's about that integrated elastic tone all the way through. Oh, this was somebody's question, Robin's question. There's more to go, because <laughs> that's a big question. Now, can I use you as a model for a moment? <laughs> Something I really like doing, you just, uh, well, let me just put a hand on just to kind of tune in. Put your feet wider apart again. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting question gives rise to all sorts of things. That's very nice. You're really going up right from your feet. Pretty good. So the chair's behind you. you come into the chair there. Um, I, I find it interesting running postgraduate workshops for teachers to have them do at some point this incredibly simple thing of putting their hands on somebody in just a flat, open way, not even trying any complex stuff around the neck and head, just as simple as it can be, and you ask the teacher to get themselves really organized, lengthening, widening, getting that undoing through the legs, getting the undoing through the arms and the shoulders that hands on back of the chair is about, and then, I'm simply going to move you out of the chair, Robin, and you say to the teacher, just keep all that elastic, integrated expansion as you move the person out of the chair. Nice sound there. Uh -huh. <laughs> Healthy crack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, between us, we did that fairly well. So I'm going to sit you down again. But what you so often find is... Here I am, the teacher, as well organized as I can be. And at the moment when I want to stand her up, there's either, I mean, there are all sorts of things that can happen. I mean, you all know that you don't want that to happen, the head falling back. There's other very interesting, subtle things. One of them is that. Ooh. You see that? <laughs> <laughs> And the other one, and I don't know if you can see it down here with my hips and legs, is I go 
I brace the hips, and, and you'll feel that in my hands as well. Now, what then happens is that my hands have communicated dis, disintegration or discoordination to you because I've disintegrated myself. Uh, what I've actually done is I've started to use my hands, arms, and shoulders as if they alone, mm. uh, th as if they didn't want to talk to the back and the rest of the body anymore. Okay, we're, yeah, we're the guys who do the work, so we're going to do the work. We don't want the rest of them hanging around helping. Mm. Or doing something similar with my legs, you know. Oh, as I move you, I really need stability in the legs and feet, so I better make myself stable. But I'm just going to move you without doing any of that. Yeah, no. If, sorry? No crack. No crack. Yeah. <laughs> well, isn't that what happens? Like, you know, it, the crack means that... I'm falling down. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't beat yourself oh, up. No, it no, doesn't no. mean that. I've experimented. Well, it normally means that a joint has suddenly moved bit more or in a slightly different way than it's moved for a while. And I think you may try this experiment some other time. Uh, do it so they crack. Mm -hmm. And then do the movement again in the same way. And you'll often find that they won't crack. Okay. Because it's like cracking your fingers, which I can't do. When you've done it, you have to wait a while before you can do it again. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's all I wanted to do if you move away. But um, what this then turns into, and I'm sure you at least witnessed this, even if you haven't maybe indulged in it yourself, and that is, uh, I start to take her out of the chair, or, or in any other movement, I start to initiate some sort of movement in Bronwyn, and I grip into myself as I do it, so I discoordinate that will almost automatically produce some discoordination in her. She'll pull her head back, brace a little, push with her legs, hold her breath, and I'll start to tell her off for doing that. <laughs> what did you, what happened there? And what were you thinking when that happened? <laughs> well, you know, you know we, we go down this path then of, of I, I pinpoint all the things she did wrong. <laughs> so, you know, you really have to check out yourself first before you actually start playing the scene. So, if it's a stack up, you can be like a teacher. Often, that is the case. Not always, though. You see, as, as you get better as a teacher, one of the things you are doing is refining your sensory appreciation so that you can get to usually know if you start to yeah. 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 And so you can be fairly sure when you did or when you didn't. And then you can fairly safely uh, you know, deal with what has happened in the other person. But you see how easily, if you're not aware of how to get and maintain the openness through yourself, and if you lose it, one of those moments of initiating action, you can go down a terrible path of blame and recrimination. <laughs> it seems to me, um, like when I'm teaching, that the reason that people are interfering is because they don't know how not to. Of course. And so it's of not course. useful. I don't find it useful to either say myself, you're doing that, you know, you're pulling in here or you're tight there. But, um, or let anyone else in the class even say yeah. it. But to go, what about if you try cleaning up here? Mm. And then they may or may not be able to. So that's, I mean, I notice you're doing that all the time. How about you free up a little bit here? Or how about you think about lengthening here? You're not saying where you're pulling down there or you're pulling in here. Yes. And well, let me, can I have another volunteer? Anybody willing to? Yeah? You see, it also. Um, you know, hooking up again, just stay, what's your name? Jenny. Jenny, okay. Jenny Thistle. Thurtle. Thurtle. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, 
I misread a name tag. I noticed the other night a name tag. It must have been yours. Yes. I thought it said Thistle. <laughs> Just I, I actually used to know someone who had that name. Um, so Jenny, you see, actually, this is a great example. I, I did that all by psychic maneuver. I just sent out the message into the ether of the kind of person I wanted them to hear. People are recording this stuff. Amazing. <laughs> Only kidding. <laughs> well, you see, if I feel around here, around the base of the neck, upper back, you know, you could say, well, there's some constriction more than perhaps there needs to be, or you know, perhaps that's the wrong way to express it. I shouldn't say that, because actually there's the amount of constriction that there needs to be given the whole situation. But we could improve the situation, because again, connecting up again to some of the scientific stuff, you know, Dr. Roberts said the key priority is to prevent your head from hitting the ground. <laughs> Well, your body will find a way to achieve that one way or another. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you walk around Melbourne, Sydney, or Canberra, uh, the only occasions when you see human beings actually failing to achieve that are probably late at night coming out of the bar. Or <laughs> Mostly, we do manage not to let the head hit the ground. But I think of it these days as being we need said to me, he had a crucial conversation with FM. They were walking home after having dinner at <coughs> FM's favorite London restaurant, the Cafe Royale, which I don't recommend these days. It's become a bit of a dump. But they were walking home, and Walter was asking FM about head forward and up. And he got this answer. The head goes forward by virtue of the fact that more of its weight in front of the pivot point on the top of the spine. But the head only goes up by the combined activity of the whole body's anti-gravity mechanisms. And I like that a lot. It's your whole body that keeps your head up and takes your head up. Your head certainly doesn't take your body up, as I said the other day, there's no little rotor blades on the top. You know the expression propeller head? Mm -hmm. You know, for geeky people? Well, you know, there is no propeller up there. So, Jenny's body takes her head up. If we bring her back up to her feet, her head needs that impetus from the ground all the way through so that she's <coughs> lightening up. She's not pressing down into herself. She's utilizing to the maximum the human body's intrinsic springiness, intrinsic anti-gravity springiness. Now, when there are parts of the body that don't participate <coughs> enough in that, when things aren't working as well as they could be, it often feels as if the neck muscles, with a sense of weary resignation, have to work double over they feel they have to do all that head support all by themselves. And you might even be able to feel at this stage yourself that we're actually getting more of you participating and supporting the head, particularly down here. And that's helping you to undo up here. Is that be right? Yeah. So it's an interesting circular relationship reciprocal relationship between the neck and the head and the rest of the body. That's right, Jenny. Beautiful. And now that opens up your breathing, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. There we are. We have real rib movement. So it isn't just that there is this awful naughty version of the Alexander Technique. That there used to be a British children's books with a character called <coughs> Noddy. And, and Noddy was not the smartest person on the <laughs> not the sharpest tool in the box or whatever. Uh, 
Nodi had to have everything explained to him very, very simply. And the Nodi version of the Alexander technique is people get into the habit of tightening the neck, they pull the head back and down, and the weight of the head presses down through the spine, and causes all sorts of problems in the back, and presses down into the legs, and everything goes to pop. So you've got to come along and teach them to free up here and let the head go on. She takes the pressure off the whole body and it all works. Well, it doesn't seem to really be that simple. And if you read FM's books carefully, there's at least three places in his books where he says something like, often the stiffening of the caused by wrong use of other parts of the body or wrong use of other muscles. And in one place he says wrong use, uh, oh, where caused by the neck trying to do work that should be done by other parts of the body, particularly the back. So here's Jenny, that's it. Now one more thing, Jenny. Don't bend your knees, but just again, think of your legs as open channels for the ground. That's it. Let the ground support you and send you up. That's right. Beautiful. Now you've really got the whole body connection. That's right. And that means the middle of your body is free to breathe. And your neck doesn't have to work so hard to support your head. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. So it's, it's a more complex reciprocal relationship of freeing the neck to let the head be a little bit better balanced in order to start to allow things to change and open up lower down in order that the neck can free itself a little more. Then you can get a little more happening all the way through the rest of the body and then you can free the neck a little more. And it goes round and round like that. And Walter referred to it to me once in an expression that I'll tell you said, you play both ends against the middle. <laughs> and I thought, well, what about that expression? Now, you play cricket in Australia. You know that the pitch is the middle. And it has two ends where the wickets are. So I thought, oh, it's an obvious, you know, it's an English expression that comes from cricket. I get to live in the USA, and I realize it's got nothing to do with cricket. It comes from a Midwest card game where you deal off both the top and bottom of the pack. <laughs> and they call that playing both ends against the middle. There's a bit of useless trivia. <laughs> Jane, you can ask a question. Yeah, no, I, I um, had read, I think that, that thought of uh, FMs is reported in one of the books where Sean Carey interviews Walter yeah. Harrington. And I played with that, and I was just thinking my experience of it is when I let the weight of my skull go forward, just the weight of the skull, it actually stimulates, like there's a moment where it stimulates the, the reflex pattern mm. to set the yes. the reciprocal relationship up. So it's sort of, yeah, I just the, wanted to add that little movement yes. moment in. There's, there's two, two issues around that, should we say. One is that you've got to have things organized pretty well already for it for that to work. So it doesn't work so well with the beginner. You really have to, you, you've got it already, you've got that connection all the way through, well organized, so a moment's thought for that just triggers and stimulates it a bit more powerfully. The other tricky thing, and Tim Cacciatore, the science guy who's also an Alexander teacher, uh, has talked about this in conversations I've had with him. What about all those situations like, for example, one, one that I like, and when, when you, you, you go to bed and you're ready to go to sleep and you turn out the light and you lie there for a while drifting. And I find it's quite entertaining to play with the Alexander technique a bit while, while you drift at that moment. So there you are, you're lying, I'm usually lying with the side of my head on the pillows. And I think about releasing my head going out. Well, gravity isn't going to do that. Mm. But nonetheless, I sometimes find 
really nice experiences of things opening up right through the whole body. It, you know, gravity's... So that one doesn't... That there are many situations, but as Tim put it, if for the primary control to work, it could only work if you were in an orientation to gravity where that happened. That, that's somewhat limiting. Yeah. I think that's the, the other issue. Depends where I'm not saying it doesn't No, work, I know, but I, I guess but I think of gravity case. in the moon as, as well as the, the ocean's tides, as well as the Earth, Whoa. I suppose. Wow, I now so. we're on something. Whoa. <laughs> so, okay, now what happens when the moon is on the other side of the planet from me? Can I, I tap into Mars or Venus? I started <laughs> thinking that because we've had tsunamis and earthquakes this end of yeah. the this end of the world, and a couple of my students walked in the door and say, you keep talking about Mother Earth and gravity, well, she's been pretty darn impossible. <laughs> you know, what am I going to think? So I started thinking yeah. about gravity as, as a constant in a different way. <laughs> yeah, well, I have to talk to Nanette about, you know, Nanette's yeah, that's very right. Nanette and I, <laughs> I, think, I think you and Nanette We'll have a conversation and we'll... <laughs> build a whole new model here, <laughs> the astrological model of the other <laughs>
it's like the cop's hand is doing that to you. You're doing that to yourself. The message you're giving your body is get ready to go that way. So if we're going to actually open up the whole body, if we're going to stimulate anti-gravity postural support processes, if the steering wheel is pointing everything that way, we're kind of not going to get very far. So you need an overall this way orientation as a starting point. That's, that seems to me to be essential. But it's not enough by itself. You've got to get this coax the organization through the entire body that then gives more and more support for the head from the whole body in such a way that you're not using your trunk muscles to have to brace yourself because that screws your breathing. It's, it's when you get the support of the head from the whole body that you're free to breathe in the natural way. The back lengthening and widening. The back lengthening and widening. But I know you probably see this happen, David. I mean, if, if you're supervising one of your third year students who's starting to teach, and sometimes by the time they've gotten to that stage of the training, they've really got a powerful sense of this as a whole body response, and a powerful sense of how, as Elizabeth Walker said, the up comes with your feet on the ground. But the trouble is they've gotten so into that that they've forgotten what it's like to be a beginner. Mm. So there they are, working away with a brand new student, a brand new student, standing there like this. And the third year one trainee teacher is saying, look at the feet just softening into the ground. Let the feet spread into the ground. Ah. standing at the back of the room trying to catch the teacher's eye. I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you've got to have that fundamental orientation. Does <laughs> that answer your question? Right direction. <laughs> um, I guess it's more on how to teach that to, be, to beginners. Okay, well, yeah. do, you, do you mean in terms of what does it mean by directing or sending a direction? That's a cop-out. That's a cop-out in the sense that it's like we've been saying a little over these last two days. If you make something totally general, mm. then it fades away into nothingness. So, um, you know, I, I could dodge the whole thing by saying, well, it depends on who you're talking to. And then, and then I get out of having to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't do that. Um, There's ways that I can explain it that are quite uh, a little bit more advanced and complex and wouldn't work for a beginner. Um, but might be useful to say to you first, because I think teachers have to have the more complex and deeper understanding so that they can then give a simple answer, but a simple answer that's based on some real knowledge. So, one way that I find it helpful these days to think about it is that when I walk across the room to pick up something like the, the white border marker, I have an objective, an end in Alexander jargon, which is pick up the white border marker. Even without the Alexander text, the parts of my brain that handle coordination have a few other objectives or parallel intentions along with getting that. The main one, of course, is don't let your head hit the ground. Other, other ones will be don't bump into anything, don't trip over the wires, etc. So, you know, I'm, I'm, parts of me are already processing several 
intentions that had to be correlated to the basic one of pick up this. You could call them also priorities. And I think at a neuroscience level, what we're doing when we're directing is we're adding some further priorities or intentions. It's almost like we're saying to the whole system, you know, when I go over there to put this bag on there, I want to get, I want to achieve that, and I don't want my head to hit the ground, but you know, I'd like you to achieve that in a slightly more refined way, please. I'd like not just to have my head not hit the ground, but I'd like my head to be supported in such a way that my neck is free, my back is lengthening and widening, my ribs are free to move, and I'm not braced in the limbs. So, I'm adding some extra demands. I'm asking for some more refinement. Now, you can't say that to a new student, obviously. So, but, but it's useful to have some background knowledge of that kind of thing. That, you know, that may, when we come to start doing more functional MRI and stuff like that on people when they're directing. Do you know, by the way, that the one and only uh, experiment so far functional MRI of what's happening in somebody's brain when they're directing. The guy who did the work, the experiment, said that what, you know, they talk about parts of the brain lighting up. He said what really lit up was the brain stem. The lowest, oldest part of the brain lit up. And that's actually the part that organizes background muscle tone and postural tone and breathing. So, okay, um, let's come down to it at a more, at a simpler level. Um, Alexander Sum, in one or two places, refers to directions as a wish. He, he says, at, there's a sentence, I know it off by heart, he says, giving the directions in the form, as it were, of a wish. And I've always thought to myself, why did he toss in that little phrase, as it were. What's the point of that? <laughs> but, you know, he's saying, giving the directions as if they were a wish. And some of the other first generation teachers used to say that. You've got to actually have some intention for where the parts of your body are going when you release muscles. This is a very obvious one. If I completely release my neck muscles, my head falls down. Absolutely no doubt about it. And this is another reason why I prefer myself when I'm teaching to right from the get-go talk about redistribution of tone rather than orient it all around letting go and releasing and having no tension. got to have some tone in your neck and back, otherwise it all falls down. If I release my shoulders, they fall down forward, and the weight of my arms drags my body down. So 